Hello and welcome to the recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. Today we've been working on the Sustainable Urban Design app. We've got a continuation of the Administrative Divisions feature. We're kind of wrapping it up a little bit here. And uh, what we've essentially done today is improve the Administrative Divisions listing page and by just tweaking the card layout a little bit, uh, added a relationship between administrative divisions and projects. So a city of Tampere, for example, would have some sub-projects. Uh, when you view those project uh, administrative division pages, or municipality in this case, you see the sub-projects listed side by side uh, with the uh, geographic area of the municipality in this case. You can view the project which also has a uh, geographic area and navigate back to the related administrative division. Both of these templates are using uh, a shared code base, uh, a shared map layer. I'll just kind of spin through the code real quick showing how we linked everything up. It's pretty standard Django stuff and I don't remember if I've read through the uh, open layers code. So we'll just go ahead and uh, go through that as well. And this, I'll try to keep it brief. And there are a few files that we've worked with today. So essentially, um, in order to link projects to an administrative division, we can just use a standard foreign key field. Let me, oh, actually, let me hop to the <laughs> first tab. Okay. Um, so for any given administrative division, we're able to list the projects. And that's actually, I should be starting here with this foreign key. And that's done because the project model has this field administrative division that's a foreign key linking it to the um, administrative division model. And the related name is projects. So from any administrative division, you know, like a municipality or city or, or something like that, you can get the projects that are related there. But any project can only really belong to one um, administrative division. Projects have previously had a geographic area because uh, like a building footprint or a transportation network would you know, have naturally a geographic scope, it's uh, optional. And today I've also added the same geographic area to the administrative division. Uh, I don't have any rules that says a project needs to be fully contained in this uh, area. It's just so we can get them both displayed on a map. And in a previous session, it's worth mentioning, we made the administrative divisions hierarchy. So for example, a city could have sub-districts. Um, so when we're looking at an individual administrative division, now we can go from that administrative division and get a list of the projects. And if there are some, if the count is more than zero, we essentially can show a, a section of six. Um, I had to specify the column width here to get the map to render correctly. And then a list group uh, showing each of those projects as list group items, centering the text and adding a small material icon just to make it look m more meaningful. Um, on the other side of things, the project page, we can then uh, in the above the title here, so here's the title, the project title, uh, I was able to create a, a small div to display the administrative division in a link by getting the absolute URL. That's d those are defined, the get absolute URL method is defined in the model in both cases. And again, using a material item, just to give it a small uh, symbolic significance, draw your eye there and kind of indicate, in this case, it's something that's on a map. And in this case, it's kind of like a something that's under development. That's the main changes to the data. The other uh, more significant, I guess, significant change to the project was since both of these p templates are essentially displaying the same map, and uh, moreover, the editing interface is basically the same. So from any administrative division, I can edit that. And any project, I can edit the project scope if I wanted to say, oh, well, these actually, these are part of the Yed and Ranta development area, or maybe it's actually smaller, maybe it's only this big. Uh, it's really all the same code. 
it's only about 100 lines of code. So I just put, I moved it to a, a new app called Maps, and then we're using a shared template. So let's take a quick look at that. Uh, and essentially, in both forms, we're including this this new shared area map template, and we're passing in a couple of context variables. Uh, that the fact that it's the map is in edit mode, meaning that we can interact with it and draw that rectangular geometry, and we're passing in the geographic area because the parent context, uh, for example, this one has um, a form, and then which has an, uh, the, the context contains an object called administrative division because I'm editing an administrative division form. But over in project, the context object is called a project. But both of them have the same geographic area property. So I, I'm just passing that into the map and rendering it, uh, the map, rendering it the geometry on the map and enabling editing of the geometry depending if it's just on the uh, display page or if it's on the edit form. So let's take a look at the map code to round this out. Essentially, uh, I wanted a base open layer, open street map base layer. So we create that with the um, OSM source and create a tile map layer there. Then in order to capture this um, geometry, we're just gonna create a vector layer and just kind of style it yellow, and put a stroke on it and um, uh, Essentially, when you're editing it, it, I think it has this uh, circle fill for the cursor icon. And the opacity is really, it's almost fully uh, transparent. Then you can take a source and a style and combine them into a vector layer. And we can now create an OSM map with our base map and our vector layer on top of it. And we're looking for this area map uh, and a div with the area map ID. And we're kind of centering the map initially. But if there's an existing area, so we're checking in the current script for a data set. So here's where we get our geographic area passed into the map template. And then the map template has a script tag that. Um, includes this map script and you can attach to any HTML element, you can attach data uh, attributes and so I'm actually able to pass data into the JavaScript from the template without having to do anything funky, it's just part of the HTML5 spec I guess. So we can pass in whether or not this is, that the fact that this is in edit mode or whether it is because that comes in from the parent template where you include it as well as the geographic area, which is also passed in when you include the template. Those get passed into the JavaScript. So you're able to get those from the current script data set uh, with the appropriate name. This is um, all lowercase by uh, convention, by actually the implementation. You cannot use uh, any uppercase letters here, or if you do, they, they get lowercase. Now in the JavaScript, I can use camel case. Uh, so if something was passed in here, it'll be a string object, basically, and we'll need to um, convert it to GeoJSON by reading the string geometry. And dealing with the map projections, our database is um, storing the data with lat-long coordinates, but open layers by default um, uses a, a web Mercator projection, so I have to kind of, this has been one of the biggest pain points, is just going back and forth between these projections. And it's probably the only... Um, major frustration with open layers. Um, yeah, just having that wrangle data projections and, and getting really unexpected results when it comes out in the wrong projection or does it, it displays in the wrong place on the map. So anyway, once we've parsed this geometry, we can add it to an open layers feature. The other frustration I have with open layers is it's very verbose. You have to think at so many different levels um, it's like almost like an assembly language for map uh, data. I understand it's a very powerful framework, but at the same time, it's just convoluted to work with. And these are meaningful things I know at a programming level, but uh, from a framework programming level, but as an, an end user, like the developer, I don't want to have to jump through these hoops just to put some data on a map, and which, which is where something like Leaflet shines. There's trade-offs in all of these. Um, 
mapping libraries. And maybe there is an abstraction in open layers that I'm missing that just lets you take some GeoJSON and then plot it on a map. But in any case, so we have to create a feature out of it and then add it to a vector source. And then what I'm able to do then is just get the extent of that and just zoom it in. So that's what actually makes the map so it's um, focused in on the, on the geographic area with a little bit of a buffer here. I put some padding around it. Um, by fitting, so we get the layer extent, the extent of the data, and if I had just put that straight into the um, map without this padding here, it's a well, it was a tight squeeze, but I guess maybe not. Anyway, I had padding before, so it would give a little bit of a buffer around there. Okay, and so that's if the ex extent exists. If it's a new um, project or geographic area, then you would just get a world map and you'd zoom in and draw a rectangle around your area of interest. Next we're going to toggle edit mode if it's available. So we're going to see if it's available by again looking in our data set for an edit mode attribute. If that's truthy, then which uh, in this case it just means it's a string. So a string is truthy. I don't think it's literally a boolean value. Uh, so maybe I could put double exclamation there or something like that. Um, we're going to add a, a new interaction, a draw interaction to this source, again the vector source. And um, it's a, internally it's a, it's a circle, where even though um, we're constraining it so it creates a box. And uh, I only want one geographic area, so when the drawing starts, when I start drawing here, it's going to delete any previous one that I've added. It's going to clear out that source layer instead of appending a new one. Um, then it's going to look for a field uh, in the Django form, which is a hidden form field. I can show that real quick. We're under maps, though, I need to go to project form, for example. Uh, we just created a custom form class, model form, for our administrative division. Uh, this is a project, but it's the same, essentially the same code if I go to edit for an administrative division. Um, there's this hidden geographic area widget so that the form will actually process the data. If you exclude any fields from your form definition or the generic view definition, um, that won't come into the template and it won't, the form itself won't parse that field. It'll kind of ignore it even if you pass that in in the request. So that hidden field has a name, geographic area. The name is the same as the field name in the um, model. And finally, when you end, uh, when you're done drawing, it's going to get the feature you just drew and, and parse it to GeoJSON. And you're drawing in uh, one coordinate system, which is this, you can't see these coordinates, but this is the web mercator. Um, and we're storing it in the database in lat longs. Um, by choice and convention, it's that Django GIS um, framework, when we have a model that has a polygon field, I think by default, the geography uh, means that it'll store lat long coordinates, unless I, I think, specify a coordinate reference system. I'm not exactly sure, you'd, sure how to do it, but yeah, I think just by default, I was just noticing that the data in the database were in lat longs. Uh, so you this is you just got to check your projections along the way, and then we stringify it so it's not an object anymore, and set that stringified value to the field value in the template. So we grab this um, hidden field, and we're just going to set the stringified value to that. So when the form submits, it gets that stringified value. And finally, we just add this draw interaction to the map because we're in edit mode, but I had to set it up in advance. So that's it. And this has been a, a sort of lengthy um, pull request, but we're wrapping it up. If I push these up, we're going to GitHub. You can see this has been one of the larger pull requests. Oh, there's another pull request that came in while we were doing this live stream. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we've been working out for almost a co couple weeks here, and you know, a few hundred lines of code, a 
a lot of commits. Uh, but I, I believe this is it where anything else will be an enhancement at this point. So that's it and it's what we accomplished in today's live coding session. I appreciate uh, the people who jumped in and uh, Dr. Enerfe, it was nice to see you in the live stream chat. It's always nice to have company. People hanging out and bringing up interesting topics to discuss. Dr. Enerfe was um, curious about Python th version 3.9. I haven't worked with it. We're still on Python 3.8 in this project. And um, just kind of checking in on what uh, it looks, the mobile cross um, platform mobile development landscape looks like what we're, and whether I'm going to be del delving into any cross-platform mobile development soon. I might and I'm leaning right now towards Flutter and we have another project where we're using a Quasar development framework but that's for another day. Anyway, thank you very much for viewing this video. If you'd like to get involved with this or other projects, please stop on by codebuddies.org. Okay, thanks again for viewing this have a good day or an evening and stay well out there.